Steven Scoggins. Welcome to the podcast, man. I'm excited to have you here. Dude, what is going on? I've been waiting to spend some time with you, man. I'll tell you what. You lit me up on Clubhouse one day. I was listening to you speak. I was like, I got to get to know this dude. This guy is powerful. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally stoked to be here with you, man. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. And right back at you. And so I would love if we could start with kind of giving the audience a little bit of your background. And if you could just yeah. film in on like, what did life look like for little Steven growing up? <laughs> little Steven. Well, little Steven thought he had it all figured out until about the age of three um, when his <laughs> parents got divorced. Uh, Cause you know, they were, you know, it's, it's like anything else when, when two broken people try to become a whole person, it just never works out. Right. And, you know, I think, I think fortunately there's enough thought leaders out there today that can at least steward us and mentor us in the direction not to do that. Right. Um, but unfortunately for my parents, my dad struggled with alcohol, mother struggled with some, um, not a mental disorder, but, uh, you know, mental struggles, you know, victim thinking and, uh, and a whole host of other things. And as a result, they had a, you know, they had a divorce. I moved in with my grandmother. She raised me until I was about nine years old until she sits Good me grandma. down. Yeah, dude, man, my nanny was amazing. Um, in yeah. fact, I tell people all the time that that was the, the point in my life that I actually felt valued, cared for, empowered, inspired. You know, she was that first person, the first person of everybody else has poured into me over the, over the years yeah. that sat down and said, I believe you can be something amazing, you know? I and that. I went from, I went from there to name? Different. nanny. That's nanny. well, nanny, na nanny, is, nanny was grandma's name. Well, at least to me, yeah. um, love it. A lot of people called her Bobby, but you know, she was, um, you know, she was amazing, but at nine years old, she comes up and sits me down. We're in a, we're in this old thousand square foot home you know, with like 70s style linoleum, orange and green. And I don't yeah. know where they got the colors from. The, the, the stove was tan and, you know, and I'm sitting down at the kitchen table and she sits me down and she says, hey, I'm going to need you to step up. Now, keep in mind, think about the nearest nine-year-old, eight, nine, ten-year-old that you can think of. Okay. Yeah. Think about the mental acuity that's associated with that young person. Right. It's, there's no way you're set up to be an adult. Yeah. Right. I literally had a GI Joe in one hand and a transformer in the other. And I'm like, uh, huh. and then, <laughs> yeah. you know, she proceeded to break some pretty bad news to me that I, I wasn't aware of. And she said, look, I need you to step up because, um, I have something called cancer. And now this is in the eighties. This is like the early eighties and, and cancer treatment back in the early eighties, um, did more damage than the cancer itself in many respects. Right, right? right. You know, and I think she knew intuitively that my parents were, you know, had kind of disassociated their lives because they were, you know, battling their own stuff. And that really we were her only, we were her, or she was our lifeline, right? She was the only thing connecting us to, you know, to stability, really. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, she, she literally pulls me up to the side and she begins to teach me how to make oatmeal and boil hot dogs mm -hmm. and make macaroni and cheese. Anything that I could boil with water or make with milk, you know, she taught me how to make for myself and my little six-year-old brother. Thanks. So I went from being the, the you know, the sleepy eyed kid waking up, we were wiping the, <laughs> wiping the sleep from my eyes with my blankie and my, and my transformer, like walking through the hallway kind of thing to all of a sudden I'm now waking up with an alarm clock to wake my little brother up to then get us dressed to then make us some cereal and then walk our butts to school. You know, so I was forced to kind wow. of grow up in a very, very quick fashion. And, you know, when, by the time I was 11, she had passed away. My father comes back into the picture, promises me he's going to you know get me karate lessons. So I go live with <laughs> him. Right. My, and my little brother goes to live with my mother in Florida. So that was a family dysfunction all over again. And then from the time I was 11 years old, I went to work nights, weekends, holidays. I was working on a construction site, uh, you know, framing homes and roofing homes and putting, you know, siding and all these different parts and pieces that go into a, yeah. a house. And I'll never forget this because I think people are limited by this a lot. My dad said something very interesting that he meant to say out of love, but he actually created a limiting belief that I believe for a number of years. And that was mm -hmm. this. Scoggins don't get ahead, they get by. His experiences in life had taught him that if you were, had the last name Scoggins, you were not destined to be anything other than less than ordinary, not even ordinary, less than ordinary. I mean, you borrow to not repay. You make promises yeah. that you won't plan to honor, right? Now, our family was a, was a family of hardworking people. Like we, like even now, I, mean, I think a lot of my diligence and, and the way in which I attack life comes so much from that DNA that is tied to that family. But I was the first one that ever was stunned by that. Cause I, I, even, even being a young, like maybe 11, 12, 13 year old, I knew there was something in me, but I wasn't really sure what it was. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so I'm, you know, so I'm in that. So I was like, I was like, that doesn't sound like truth, but this is my dad. He loves me. He's got to be telling me the truth. Yeah. 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 You know, so I, you know, so from that standpoint, we just battled off and on. My dad had a business and lost a business. Uh, we, we had people come up and take our stuff, you know, how, you know, the house we had, the cars we had. And right. You, so to kind of look at it, then you, with him, you were, you, that's the life you were living. Is that yeah. you weren't getting ahead because you were a Scoggins. And I think exactly. one thing that's really interesting you say there and something that I've learned from some of my mentors is that the strongest force in us mm -hmm. is to yeah. live in alignment with who we believe we are. Exactly. And so it's yeah. like from that moment, just like you said, that battle of internally, my, mm -hmm. my, my greatness that, that we all have in us knows that's not true, but my dad loves me. Yeah. So such a, I can only imagine and 11 years old, right? You're now you're cooking, you turn <laughs> into a man, you got an alarm clock yeah. 11. Now you hear this kind of like heartbreaking thing. I I'm curious, you know, if someone's listening to this and they kind of have a similar thing where maybe they grew up and their parents said, we don't get ahead or yeah, all these different messages. Or you're, or you're, or you're not enough, or I, I wish you'd never yeah. been born all these crappy lies. Yeah. And it's crazy because you're so impressionable when you're younger, right? Your, your yeah. mind is so malleable. And so it's so easy for those messages to come into you and you accept that as your identity. I'm curious if someone's listening to this and they're going like, like a light bulb went off right now and they're yeah. like, holy crap, like that th th you're, you're talking to me. Yeah. Like what tip would you give them on how, how can they take that first step to, to start to realize this is not me, but not just say, this is not me, but like yeah. own that. Well, I think the first tip you have to understand is to understand, and this is an understanding you got to let resonate your soul. Yeah. And that's the, that is those that gave you life are not the same people that create your destiny. Mm. All because they gave you life does not necessarily mean that they are going to shape who you're going to become. You know, I've, in, in my experience, and I know you've seen this as, as well, we have a lot of people in the world who are doing the wrong thing because someone else said so. They're doctors and lawyers and all these different things that they had never, I think what Jay Shetty said not long ago that his parents said, if he was anything other than a doctor or an attorney, <laughs> that they, they were going to disown him. Right. Yeah. And, and he, and he even talked in one of his books about how, how he struggled with that for a number of years because he's like, I love my, I want to, I want to feel appreciated and valued and loved by my family. And here's what I've understood. Steve Mark, uh, my first mentor that I met on the job site, he's my dad's employer. Right. You know, he, he told me so much, but one of the things he told me a long time ago after he began to help me understand that how I thought was going to dictate how my future was going to be shaped. And I never heard of that concept before. He did it in a very uh, bullet, bullet pointing way yeah. when he asked me, so what's the difference between a rich man and a poor man? And I'm like, well, duh, money. He's like, absolutely not. It's the way they think. Yeah. And he said, a wealthy person always Love is that. always invest for a brighter day in relationships and finance in any area of life. A poor man is always living in an area of lack and always looking at spending everything that he has, whether it's his life, his, his relationships or his finance. You know, so that was my first like, holy crap, that's like, <laughs> wow, that's like, you know, truth bomb before we had microphones yeah. we could drop, right? Yeah. You know, so we did that. And then, you know, then he said this, this next thing. He said, look, you have to understand that you have to be willing to do today what others won't so you can have tomorrow what others don't. And that one quote has been one of the top five defining principles that I have lived by that actually got me out of homelessness and got me out of uh, some of the difficult yeah. places that I've been in life, the, the almost the suicide attempt and all that stuff. Because I realized that I was doing the things solely based on someone else's thought process. I hadn't taken ownership of my thought process. In other words, I hadn't, I hadn't accepted that, like, wait a minute. I can make my own decisions. Yeah. My last name has nothing to do with who I really am. I got a fire burning. Mm. Like, I may, not, I may not understand what to do with it just yet, but I got a fire burning. So let me go knock some stuff down. Let me see what shakes out of the tree. And the more and more I just kept on doing that and doing that, and this is where I, this is where I think um, that people can maybe get a takeaway, is when you understand that those that gave you life don't necessarily shape your destiny, and then you begin to understand that you have to own your destiny. Right. You've got to own your future. You got to own your life. You got, you got to own your next steps. And then it becomes my only limitation at that point is me. Yeah. How fast I can grow, how fast I can commit, what kind of relationships I allow, allow or disallow in my life, how I spend my money, what financial principles I live. Because at the end of the day, a, every single principle in life, okay, good or bad, 
So for example, a bad principle would be spend more than you make. <laughs> okay. That's a bad principle. Bad principle for sure. Bad principle. A good principle is, hey, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm creating a framework to, you know, for most Americans, get their butt out of debt first, like yeah. step one. Step two, okay, now I got liquidity. What do I do with it? What do people do with money, right? So for example, I'm a business owner. I got six companies to, as of right now. Yeah. Various levels of success and revenue in each one of those, okay? When everybody started selling stuff and freaking out during COVID, I sat still. <laughs> and I waited for the stocks to drop and I waited for the houses to go on sale and the stuff to go on sale. And then I bought some stuff. Right. Because they were on sale. Because they were on sale. Don't think that way. Exactly. People, you know, one of the things I see with entrepreneurs specifically in, in life is, is they go through this momentum phase where they create momentum, create momentum, create momentum, create momentum, right? And then in the stock market, they refer to that as the bull market, right? The bull is charging. Everybody get behind the bull. He's knocking stuff down. Like win, yeah. win, 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 win. <laughs> life has taught me that when everybody else is running with the bull, you should be preparing for the bear. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's not that you're not taking some, some, some liquidity off the table to maybe to do something nice for your family or to take a vacation or something like that. It's not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when times are good, that's when you should be pulling liquidity and getting that cash kind of con concept, right? When times are bad, that's when if you have done the other work first and you've, done, you've, you've taken the time to get capital deployed or in staging yeah. areas where it can be deployed later, if you'll take the time to do that work first, when the bear happens... And everybody else is freaking out because everybody else makes, a, makes financial decisions, relational decisions, and self-improvement decisions based on emotion. Yeah. They don't take the time to think. And what does Steve Meyer teach me? If you want to think differently, you will have differently. Yeah. You know, so, so much of life is all about mindset. And you know, for me, my first, my first chain of bondage was the expectation of those that were around me. And, you know, for me, my, with my parents being kind of in and out of my life early on, a lot of my influences were what I, what I refer to as a parental influence, right? I had surrogate parents. I had girlfriends, mothers, and fathers that took care of me, right? You know, in fact, a well, high school girlfriend's mother is the one that talked me off, uh, taught me off a, little, a literal bridge about to take my own life. Yeah. You know? So, so one thing that's interesting that I really want to jump back to is like, and I've had a similar process in my life where, and you and I were talking before we jumped on yeah. that uh, you're in North Carolina and mm -hmm. I haven't even thought of this in years, but I was in North Carolina at a conference when I sort of first had this realization of like mindset, like I'm controlling my yeah. thoughts and I can change my thoughts. And if somebody else has done something, that means I have the capability to do it as well. I just haven't mm -hmm. learned it yet. And one of the biggest takeaways I got when I was there was that if I'm successful, it's my fault. And I think mm -hmm. we often get that. Like if, if I'm successful, it's, it's because of me. But on yeah. the flip side, what I began to realize is if I'm not successful, it's also my fault. Right? Mm -hmm. If I'm successful, it's my fault. Yeah. If I'm not successful, it's also my fault. And then once you take that ownership, that allows you, like you said, that when something happens to rather than react, sit, take a deep breath, yeah. look around, get calm, and then ask yourself, what do I want to do? What are my thoughts? What is my mm -hmm. internal GPS telling me what to do? And then it's obviously a process of building that muscle of trusting yourself yeah. so that eventually you have the bigger decisions you need to make and you can trust that internal guide. And one thing that I'm curious, and you mentioned this, that you do what most people won't do so you mm -hmm. can live a life that most people won't. So yeah. nowadays you have all these businesses, you're doing mm -hmm. ridiculously well with all the companies and the businesses. Oh, thank you. I would be curious if we go back to you in your early days when you're working on mm -hmm. the houses, when you're, you're yeah. not owning all these companies. Yeah. What were some of the things you did differently that now looking at your life today, you could look back and go, those are the things I did differently that has allowed me to live the life I live today, which is a different life than most. Yeah. I think the number one thing that I did differently, especially looking at the, my surrounding influences at the time, you know, call them friends, call them people from high school, call them family members or whatever was I intentionally said, for the next three years, I am going to eliminate every single distraction. I'm going to focus on building a business or really building me, get myself out of debt. I'm going to focus on me. And I looked up four and a half years later have not, and had not taken a single day off, a Sunday, a Saturday, a Monday, a Tuesday, a holiday, a rain day, a snow day. 
Dang. Because I, I discovered that without critical action, backed by actual diligence and commitment, that no, no result or nothing good was ever going to come out of it. You can't, what I, so here's what, here's what I see people doing on a consistent basis. And that is this, they, they have well-intentioned goals. Maybe they, maybe they actually take the time to get super clear on outcomes. They, they, they feel it, they sense it, they can see it, they taste it, they touch it, they get a vision board, they do all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. And for two weeks, they're like, I'm at this, man. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Right. And on week number three, they wake up and go, man, dude, I'm freaking tired today. <laughs> oh, man, I have, I've been burning the candle at both ends. This is, this is just too much. I, don't, I just, uh, wow. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'm going to take a rest day today. I've earned it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a rest of the day. I'll, I'll come back to it tomorrow. And then tomorrow never comes or tomorrow is, it shows up four weeks later. And you're like, oh, crap, what have I been doing? I'm, I'm yeah. back playing Xbox or PlayStation all the time or scrolling for social media on, on, you know, at random or dancing on TikTok all the time rather than, you know, yeah. beating your dream down. Right. And the one thing that Steve taught me specifically, my, again, my very first mentor, he taught me, he's like, if you want it, you have to go get it. No one owes you a dang thing. They don't owe you anything. Your parents don't owe you. Your friends don't owe you. The world doesn't owe you. If you want to create an amazing life, you have to create an amazing life. That, that's why the first word is create. Mm. You can't create what you can't imagine. So why not spend time imagining a better life? Why not spend time imagining a stronger business? Why not spend time imagining a more beautiful relationship? Why not spending time imagining a more confident, more resolute you? Yeah. You know, and during that four-year period, again, once I committed, I just didn't, I just didn't pick my head up. Yeah. I went to work and I'll give you an, I'll give you a quick rundown of how my day used to be. I wake up at 5 a.m. I would get on my construction clothes. I'd load up the, the tools in the trailer and I would then boogie that thing all the way to the job site. Yeah. I would then work from call it like six. Cause some of the job sites were good 45 minutes away right. from six until 1130. I would go to my truck. I would change my clothes, put on a pair of khakis and a polo shirt. And I'm sure I didn't smell very nice. <laughs> I would then go to a customer, a potential customer and say, hi, I'm Steven Scoggins. I know you don't know who I am. I know you don't know that about me. I know that if you look, I don't have a website. I don't have a phone. I don't, I don't have any of that stuff that my competitors right. have. But what I do have is I will get the job done on time with excellence and you won't have to worry about it. I will be the trade that you don't even think about. And I would do my pitch, right? Then the, a lot of times, about 50% of the time they say, well, okay, well, here's a set of plans. Bid that. Let's see how you come out. I would go and I would go back to, I would take that set of plans. I would go back to my, my truck. I would yeah. truck Jeep, go all the way back to the job site. I would change back into my construction clothes. I'd work until dark, stop at Wendy's on the way home to grab some food. And then I would work on those plans until one or 2 AM. And then I would do it again yeah. and again and again and again. And four and a half years later, the competitors that I was so worried about because I went under the radar, they never saw me coming. Hmm. All of a sudden there was this like this, the, this overnight success mentality, right? I'm busting it for four and a half, straight up five years, commitment, 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 commitment. You're not going to stop me. You're not going to stop me. I heard thousands of no's. I had thousands of people quit. Well, not thousands, but I had people in my life that yeah. said they're going to be part of something amazing and they, and they walk because it takes a lot to create something out of nothing. I'm a high school dropout, dyslexic, with no training whatsoever in running businesses. I have made numerous mistakes, but I've learned from every last one of them. To me, the best experience in life is life. Yeah. You know, I, the, school doesn't teach you how to live life. It teaches you how to take a test, you know, and, it, and I'm not frauding school because there's certain professions you need that kind of thing. I mean, lawyers and doctors, obviously you got to know your stuff. I definitely don't want a, a you know, a, a dentist person working on my heart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they might remove the wrong thing, you know, <laughs> kind of thing, but. You know, there, there's a time and a place where you have to take complete ownership, right? Complete ownership of who you are, who you want to be. And for a lack of a better word, to hell with everybody else. And I don't mean that in a rude way. I mean, like, you have to have the mentality, like, I'm going to focus on me. Yeah. You Pick a timeline, you commit and go. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, if you can't take care of yourself, how are you supposed to take care of anybody else? Exactly. And far right. too many, the funny thing is we become students of other people but we never become students of ourselves. Yeah. And it's interesting too, you say like the best life experience you get is from life itself. And I think that's such a true thing when it comes to figuring out your life. Like so often 
we, if from people I've worked with, you sit on a couch and you go, well, do I want to do this? Or would I like that? Or would I enjoy this more? Or would I be better at this? And mm-hmm. you never almost sometimes put yourself in the actual game of life. Yeah. You never get to try it. Like I yeah. have this stupid analogy I share all the time. It's like the way you found out you like pizzas, you tried it. That's you right. Look at the pizza and go, it smells good. Tastes good. My friend said pizza is yep. good. So I like pizza. You tried it and you were like, holy crap, pizza is good. I'm going to yeah. have this the rest of my life. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? had to say, I had the same experience with sushi. Now I love sushi. I eat it all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you're like sushi, raw fish. I, I agree. You taste it though. You're like it's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Um, so one thing I'm curious is I was, you know, reading up on you. And one of the things I saw that you talk about is that sometimes it's that people go through life and they feel like mm-hmm. they're this boat. They're kind of just like floating mm-hmm. in the ocean and, and not really knowing what way they want to go. And that you've become this rudder for a lot of people giving mm-hmm. them that guidance on you. You may feel like you're in an ocean, but steer this yeah. way or go that way or don't go that way. Um, I would be curious, like, what would you say is one of the first steps you give people in reclaiming their direction? Number one thing is this. Watch. <sighs> <laughs> Seriously. Having people just be um, my, my grandfather, um, who, is, who became a, a, an amazing spiritual mentor when I was anything less than spiritual. He would just say, keep digging, keep digging. But he, w- he taught me as, this process. And anytime I feel like I'm getting overwhelmed or anxious, ang- anxiety starting to pop up or whatever, because I'm human, that stuff, you know, it pops yeah. up you know, again. He says, breathe. And then he would use the term, be still. I know that I am God. Hmm. Be still, just be still for a moment. Now, whether someone shares my faith level or not, or they, they have a different faith level, that's, that's irrelevant. The, the principle here is if you're constantly on a, uh, a, tread, a, tread, a tread wheel, a tread wheel, gosh. Treadmill? Treadmill, yeah. A treadmill. <laughs> if you're constantly on a treadmill or some kind of rat race or whatever, you know, the rat, rat wheel. I'll try to merge the words together. Um, <laughs> if you're constantly on those things and you're not taking time to have any level of rest, you're not going to have any level of clarity. Mm. Um. As someone who's very committed, very diligent, very work life driven, I'm, I'm to me work. I'm I'm a self described workaholic. Like I, I like to get crap done. Okay. Yeah. Sure. That being said, every every amazing vision, everything that came came from universe, God, whatever you want to call it, came from asking. But asking in a point of not when I'm under duress and not when I'm under pressure and not when I'm freaking out and not when the world's falling at my head. That's not when I'm asking the questions. That stuff may be happening, but being where I am now, now I, I try to get myself centered. I grab a pencil and a pad and I'd say, what, what are some things I'm good at? Okay. Good at, well, I'm good at speaking. Okay. What are some things I go, well, other people say I'm really good. I talk in fortune cookie which means apparently I drop wisdom without knowing I'm dropping wisdom. Okay, great. Um, I'm good. I'm good with people. Okay. Well, I'm good with, uh, I'm good. Well, I, it looks like I'm okay with business. I could probably, I could probably strengthen that some. And I just start making lists of the things that come natural and easy to me. And then when I get done with that list, I call, I call someone or text someone or connect with someone who knows me well enough to show me and tell me the areas I don't know about myself, the good and the bad and the ugly. But I asked them, what is something that comes natural to me that I have no idea is difficult for other people? Because certain things in our, in our tactical strengths and our gifts and our talents, so much of that is stuff that we do every day, not thinking about it, which is why we're not leveraging it to begin with, because we don't know it exists. You know, so if, if I'm trying to get to the, the next level, if you will, I'm going to spend time in being still. I'm going to spend time being quiet, and I'm going to spend time asking great questions of myself. In fact, one of the most pivotal questions that I ever asked myself that actually became my first book uh, a number of years ago, um, I was on a treadmill, an actual treadmill, not a, not a rat wheel, but a treadmill. <laughs> yeah. And I was going at it and I, was, I had just come through a massive season. I had, I had, I had built a, at the time a $15 million business. I had 25 team members. I, I, had, I, had the, I had a sports car in the garage. I had a nice house. I had my company vehicle. I could travel. I could go and do. Um, most of my company was, and myself were more or less out of debt. I had a little bit here, there, but it was, wasn't a lot, you know, stuff I could write a check for and pay off or whatever. Right. And yet I was empty. 
And I would be in my closet. This is where I do my meditating and prayers. It's, it's just something I do. It's just it's my quiet place. No one can bother me, right? <clears throat> I was in there and I was like, I don't understand. I don't understand. And I would be asking this, this question. Help me understand. Please give me wisdom. Help me understand. Give me wisdom. Give me perspective. Show me, show me, show me, show me. And then one day I'm on a treadmill and I'm at the gym and I pull out my iPhone at the time, iPhone 4S at the time, pull that joker out and I write these words. What does it take to change the essence of a man? And then right below it, what does it take to change the essence of Stephen? You see, in that moment, I knew I wasn't a great leader, but I had no idea how to become a great leader. Well, once I began to say, what does it take to change the essence of the man that I am? I was able to articulate the things that I wanted to change, which I'd never really kind of spent the time to really kind of like look at. Right. And then I just said, okay, well, what's the opposite? What's the polar opposite? So if, if I'm a man who, who um, gets very defensive or doesn't listen very well, well, that's not who I want to be. Well, what's the opposite? Well, the opposite is someone who is a great listener. Well, how do they do that? Well, they allow mm. other people to speak first and they always speak last. Well, what's the principle behind that? You have two ears and one mouth for a reason, <laughs> right? I'm serious. I mean, but it's, we True. make life mastery so stinking complex and it's so much easier than we allow it to be because we are so focused on the adversity or whatever we're feeling in the moment. And you have to be able to step outside of the emotion and step into some, some mental, mental acuity, mental process. And the easiest way there is to be still, be reflective, and ask great questions. And if you can do those things, you're going to get better answers. And just like our good friend Tony would say, you're going to get better results, right? Yeah. There's a reason why some of us say some of the same stuff in different ways. It's because it's backed up by a principle that always delivers a promise of fulfillment yeah. every time, time and time again. So that would be my advice. Hope it helps. Yeah. And I, and I love it too, that you're saying like, as you're exploring some of these thoughts, asking yourself, well, what's the inverse of that? Mm -hmm. And it's like, so often the inverse of that is, is the truth that you're seeking. Yes. And if you can get that clarity, then that allows you to, again, change mm -hmm. your rudder and move in that direction. And it's, and I love how you touched on questions because I am like such a massive, massive believer in quality questions, right? Like yeah. the questions we ask ourselves dictate our focus. Therefore that dictates our action. And one of the things that I've done very similar to you is I will go, uh, I live near the beach. And so oftentimes I'll go, I'll just sit by the beach. It's not when life's rough or things are going yeah. bad. It's just a regular sort of checkup that I do, um, mm -hmm. with my faith as well. And again, whatever people believe, but it's a moment where I allow myself to get still and just ask myself, what's great in my life. What do I want more mm -hmm. of? What, what do I want to change? What do I want to focus on? And one of the most interesting things I've noticed in that process and very similar to you is sometimes I'll sit there and be asking for guidance and I'll ask one question 10 times over and over and over of, you know, what, what should I do with my life next? Mm -hmm. And I keep asking that question. And if I don't get after asking that question several times, quite the answer that I want, mm -hmm. I realize that I need to actually shift the question that I'm asking. There you go. So maybe I go from what am yeah. I supposed to do next to asking a better question because better questions mm -hmm. get better answers. Maybe I ask, well, what do I really want? And mm -hmm. then maybe when I shift that question, all of a sudden, boom, I get yeah. the answer. Right. Yeah. So it's like, just like you're saying, having, having the right questions is huge. Absolutely. Well, you know, and at the end of the day, I've, I've discovered that every human, this is, I'm being, I'm, I don't have a study to prove this, but this is my, <laughs> this is, how, this yeah, is yeah. everybody that I come in contact with that, that yeah, I can yeah. prove. I've discovered that everybody that I've worked with, and I've worked with people um, that I would refer to a blue collar worker, which I, I proudly wear my blue collar every day, right? Um, all the way to some of the professional entertainers and some of the other folks that I've worked with. Uh, they all have three common questions in common that they're trying to get answers to at different levels and at different times and at different seasons. And the first number one question is, who am I? Who am I really? But nobody ever asked that question of themselves with a pen and a pad. And if they do ask that question so many times, they begin to write all the problems themselves that, that they have with themselves rather than all the gifts and the talents that they possess. I'm a big believer that if you have a, what I refer to as a blacklist of the things that you know, you want to work on and improve that you should strive and even force yourself to write a list that's greater on the opposite side of gifts, talent, strengths, and offerings, right? Love that. Because when you do that, you, you, you begin to shape 
self-awareness and you know there's obviously there's personality style stuff out there that, you know, we use disc and values and attributes i know tony's done the same thing before yeah. i mean there's any the, there's a thousand different ways for you to get more clarity on who you are and how to position that because what people do is they get these questions out of order and which is why they always get negative results so if question number one is who am i question number two is what do i do right i'm sorry who am I? Why am I here? Purpose, passion, contentment. Okay. If you don't know who you are, you don't know what strengths you can leverage, which means you're not actually leveraging your strengths towards something that's going to bring you fulfillment. Okay. Yeah. So who am I? Why am I here? Which is only shaped by doing question number one first. And then the following question is, is what do I do about it? Okay. And you're going to understand that that question is going to involve probably three to five times in your life. You know, when I started the, the construction business that became my flagship, right? But who am or who am I? I'm a construction guy who needs to eat and need shelter. Right. That's, I mean, I, I'm just yeah. being honest, right? That was where yeah, I was at. I love it. Okay. Why am I here to find, sh to get food and find shelter? What do I do about <laughs> yeah. it? Get my ass to work. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? True. You know, and then, as, and then I began, as, as I began to build and do this, you know, there were, there were different, about every, it was almost like five year evolutions. Like every five years, that became clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer, all the way to 15 years after that, right? My flagship company's doing well. I'm now starting to dabble in other businesses. I stumble, I'm at a Dave Ramsey event with some of his folks. I stumble hmm. across one of their team members and says, Have you ever thought about being a speaker? I'm like, Uh, nope. What do they do? Well, they, you know, they do what Hogan and those guys do. They, they speak right. on stage. I'm like, dude, I'm a construction guy. No, no, no. You're, you're more than a construction guy. In fact, you're actually really dynamic and you move a lot. And you're passionate. Da, 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 and people kind of gravitate towards you. I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah. So on the way home from Nashville, I'm, I'm like, who am I? Yeah. Am I more than just this construction guy? You know, your occupation should never be your identity. It should just be part of the train track. You know what I'm saying? I learned this entire time. In fact, here's one of the most interesting pivotal moments, two, two most interesting pivotal moments I've ever had in my business career in life. Number one, biggest mistake I ever made in business by far that cost me the most money, the most team members, everything. Okay. Biggest mistake is building a business without building myself. Mm. Number one, number one up there. Holy stupid. Are you, are you a knucklehead? Yes, I am a knucklehead. I, I carry a knucklehead card in my pocket, right? The next thing is I discovered that in building myself, I began to build other people around me by accident, organically, not even thinking about it, which then took me to a new epiphany, which was I have a construction company, but it's actually a personal development company masquerading as a construction right. company right? It's, it's Bruce Wayne into Batman or Clark Kent into Superman. Yeah. And we all have that part and piece of us because, you know, at this stage in the game, who am I? I'm a very gifted and talented individual who deeply cares about the outcomes of other people. Why? Because I've experienced enough suffering and things that come along in my life that I, that I know I can help somebody not have to go to that depth level of, of suffering to get the questions that they have answered. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's who am I? Why am I here? I'm here to serve the person I used to be. That's why I'm here. I'm here. That's who I'm, 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 I'm dedicated to Sally Joe. I'm dedicated to Bobby. I'm dedicated to whoever's on the, whoever's on the yeah. calendar, right? I'm dedicated to you because you are on the same journey I was. And I know if I do it well, you'll do it well. Yeah. Right. Love. But what do I do about it? Well, I put myself out there. I, I get to come on amazing shows like yours and, and spend some time with amazing people like yourself and watch and see what shakes out of the tree. And, and, and hopefully there's lots of you know, value nuggets and stuff. And, you know, then I'll, you know, I'll do a live event here in October and we've got, you know, we're doing filming all day today with some friends of mine coming to my live events that are to use our stages and our, and our different, you know, um, you know uh, what do you call it? Staging areas or whatever. Yeah. You know, all of those are ways of serving. It doesn't have to be my face and my voice that people see for me to make an impact. Steve Myrick, nobody knows who that, none of your followers knew who the hell Steve Myrick was until I brought his name up today. <laughs> Very, yeah. Right? But he transformed my life. He changed everything. Yeah. I, I'm With curious. One idea. What would you say is the importance of, because I know you're a big fan of personal development. What would you say is the, 
importance of getting into personal development, regardless yeah. of if you own a business, if you're just working a nine to five, if you're just figuring out what your life, what you want to do with your life, like what would you say yeah. is the importance of having a silver line of personal development throughout that? The silver. All right. So I, I think the, the way I would do it was the, the ultimate result of the ultimate outcome. If you don't get involved in personal development and actually taking your life mastery simple or your life mastery seriously, if you, if you don't take the time to do that, then you will look up because as you're, you're probably realizing by now, Stu, that the older that you get, it seems like the quicker life kind of goes by. Yeah. Right. When you know, you're six, all of a sudden Absolutely. summers, it was like, you know, for stuff like a decades long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you get 19, you're like, it was like a month, yeah. like maybe two. Right. You're, if you don't take it seriously, you are, you are going to wake up one day, either on a gurney or in a lazy boy or something at the end of your life. And you're going to be like, holy cow, I wasted so much time, so much energy. I, I believe not just because, not because of my person of faith and all that kind of stuff, but because I believe that every single person on the planet has a divine created value within them. And the only thing that keeps you from unlocking that divine created value in you is you. Yeah. Whether or not you choose it, we're all given that power of choice. I can either choose to just exist or I can choose to fight and win. Let's go. Exactly my point. Let's go, Stephen. Okay, so um, there has been so much value. We could go another three hours here, but... Um, I'm curious, you know, if people want to get more info on you, see what you're up to, everything you're doing, because you're doing a massive amount of good things in this world. Uh, where can people find more information on you? Yeah, let's uh, let's 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 do Instagram and stevenscoggins.com. You can find me at Perfect. Stephen underscore Scoggins because somebody won't give me my name <laughs> that hasn't used I Instagram. Saw that, I saw that. <laughs> like, sure. come on, man. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. But hey, um, no, just yeah. hit me up on Instagram. Uh, I will. I'll be honest with folks. Uh, my Instagram is. Um, it's a place I do connect with the audience. I, I, I will, I actually have Instagram on my phone and I can stuff. My <laughs> nice. team will also respond. And the way to know if you got my team or me is to see if, if there's a misspelling. Cause if I miss, if it's, misspelled, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> so love it. Awesome. And so we'll put all that in the show notes. And one last question I have for you, we ask all of our guests, this sure. is we want to help people find direction, but just like you've lived your life, we're a believer that it's through execution. I mm -hmm. can't just sit on a couch. You got to do stuff. Yep. And so I would be curious, what would you say is one thing someone listening to this can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction in their life? Number one thing is to solidify which area of life needs the most focus and then read a book on it. Love it. Love it, it man. Baby awesome. steps. Well, well, Steven, uh, again, man, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we really appreciate you. So thank you, Steven. Love you, man. Thanks, man. See ya. Cheers.